Uh, welcome to the uh, return to national competition Q&A session. We're just going to spend a couple of minutes waiting for people to join. So if you could bear with us, hopefully you can see the screen um, well, with the presentation on it. And um, also, if you do have any questions during this time, during this, this call, please put them in the chat. So have the chat ready and we'll get going in a couple of minutes. Welcome to those who've just joined. Uh, we're just waiting for another another minute or so for people to join the call, uh, and then we'll get going. But meanwhile, make sure you can see the presentation that I'm sharing and uh, have, have the chat ready in case you have any questions. Okay, I think we can we can start, and we'll just admit people as they as they join. But welcome everybody to this Q and A session. Um, I, hopefully, some of you joined us a couple of weeks ago for the return to competition presentation that Harry Harry and I did. And following that, um, Harry and I both thought that there's a lot of information for everyone to take in, and we wanted to give you a couple of weeks to think about it, and then um, ask and follow up questions. Hence, this meeting tonight. So joining us also today is, is David Foreman. Some of you may know him already and met him. He's the executive director of the College Squash Association. Um, I know many of you have some concerns about college recruitment and college squash. And so we thought it would be great to have, have him on the call. He can tell you directly what the situation is and answer your questions with reference to that. And of course, we have Harry joining us, our director of junior development. Um, so tonight, we really want to um, answer, try to answer some of the questions that have been coming in over the last couple of weeks and that people have submitted on the form. So we'll quickly review what that transition plan um, is, and then we'll go through some questions, as I said, that people have been asking, go through some player scenarios and what that means for everybody. Um, we'll review the college recruitment and college questions that people have, and also make sure that we answer all the questions that have been submitted so far. What we'll do also is we'll, we'll take some breaks at the end of some sections and take some questions on those, those particular sections. So we'll try and make it a little bit more um, conversational uh, as, as far as it can be on a Zoom call. We would ask that you put your questions on the chat. That's the easiest way for us to monitor that and to make sure that uh, the questions are addressed. So without um, further ado, let's uh, go into the reviewing the transition plan. So our transition plan for going back to a points-based system is comprises of three phases, three main phases. One's prepare for play, play for ranking points, and then a ranking point system will start again. So we're currently in the uh, start just before the prepare for play um, phase. This phase is where we really ask people to get ready, uh, get their head back in the game, get themselves fit, play some matches, try to record those matches, try to get your rating, um, indicating your current playing level. So it's really a preparation time. And during that time, we'll be putting tournaments on that are ratings-based tournaments to, uh, across the country where we can to provide players with the opportunity to get that practice, that practice play in. And the kind of formal start of that phase is April 12th. 
Then we're going to go uh, to the Flaker ranking point set, um, phase, which is the kind of first serious squash, I guess, has been played, uh, played since I think exactly this day last year. Um, this is when we closed down. So it's nice on uh, a year later to be able to say this is how we're opening up. So from Memorial Weekend through to Labor Day, we'll be putting on tournaments across the country where you can earn points. And those points will subsequently be used to help form a, a ranking, a points-based ranking, which we hope to start from uh, September 2021. So three main phases. I'm not going to go into massive detail um, in the way that we did last time. I want to go straight to some of the questions that people have had about how we're going to give you points, how the rating factors into that. And there were two um, particularly key terms that we introduced two weeks ago. One was the ratings confidence index and one was phantom points. And there were a lot of questions around, well, what is that? How are you going to determine that? What are the points surrounding that? And we've done some more work on that since two weeks ago, which we're going to go into tonight. So what I'm going to do now is hand over to Harry. He can give you a little bit more detail about a couple of these terms and key factors uh, which will come into play for the return to uh, competition. So Harry, could you explain a little bit more than we did two weeks ago about what these, what these things are? I'll, I'll do my best. But uh, thanks, Kim, and, and thanks, everyone, for, uh, for taking the time out of your um, Thursday evening to, to join this call. Um, we're all incredibly excited at US Squash to kind of get the ball rolling and it's starting to feel like there's a lot of momentum and, and we're, we're incredibly excited to, to start pushing forward and getting more tournaments on the calendar and uh, getting uh, back to a more normal sense of, of junior squash as we, we all know it and remember it. Um, but so as Kim said, the rating confidence index is um, a, a concept that we introduced uh, two weeks ago at the, the community, uh, the, the junior call. Um, and it has to do with phantom points, the transition plan, and ultimately how U.S. squash is going to be assigning points to players um, in this restart process. Um, so again, this, this concept of phantom points, which we're actually going to cover in more detail in the next slide, um, is comprised of two separate components. One is a um, conversion of a player's rating to a point value, which determines the maximum number of points that each player is actually eligible for. And then there's the rating confidence index, which is what we're, uh, we have on this slide, which um, is effectively a simple measure of a player's recent participation. Um, and by recent, we mean since October, um, early October of 2020. Um, and it comprises of any match that has been played um, and submitted into Club Locker through an organized play uh, avenue. So that means anything from tournaments to um, ladders, leagues, box leagues. Um, it could be just it, like a, a club event, a district event, um, really anything that went through the system. The only types of matches that would not be counting towards um, the, a player's RCI is um, just a, a club match. Uh, player A calls player B and they record it in the system. So it does need to be through a formal um, organized play structure, uh, which I did just list all of those. Um, so ultimately, a, a, as you can see here, um, the impetus behind or the, the thought behind the RCI is the more a player plays, as reflected by or as indicated by the results that they've recorded in the system through the system, the more points that they're actually able to unlock uh, in this phantom points um, assignment that US Squash will be doing uh, at the end of May. Um, so ratings, as we all know, they're just a measure of players, a player's ability, but they largely depend on, on results being entered into the system. Um, so in order to have a higher degree of confidence in the accuracy and the stability of a player's rating, we need to make sure that players are um, recording results. And we, we hear uh, from, from a ton of coaches and players and families that their, their, their players, their kids um, are all eagerly playing, practicing, um, but we're, we're not necessarily seeing um, all of those results being entered into the system. So. Um, in order to maximize the points that are going to be assigned to players, um, the, the way to do so is to record these matches in the system um, to provide more data points for the overall 
ratings algorithm to provide a higher level of accuracy and stability to each individual player, um, which then allows gives US squash a higher level of confidence in the points that we're assigning to the players based on um, their, their player ratings. Um, so I think that's a, a good place to possibly stop on ratings uh, confidence index, unless you have additional pieces you want to add, Kim, or, or questions that came through um, that you'd like to ask. No, I think the main one of the main um, factors here is to make sure people understand that the the matches uh, exclude the friendly matches. So any recorded, uh, as, as Harry said, accredited play. And I think the other questions that people asked are, are probably answered by by this table. I don't see any other questions coming in. So um, if you do, then please put them on. Um, will the points affect the ratings? Won't the points affect the ratings? The question that's being asked. Will the points affect the, the ratings? Rate. I'm not entirely I'm not sure, sure um, what that uh, the details of that question, but it's a player's rating. All players in the system right now have ratings, assuming that they've played in matches within the past 45 months. A minimum of one win and one <clears> loss gets a player a rating. Um, and in this process of assigning phantom points, which we'll also go into a little bit more in the next slide um we'll take a player's rating and it'll be converted into a point value and then based on a player's rci that point value will be adjusted by this 100 percent, 90 percent, or 80 percent metric so on a high medium low scale okay so a couple of questions that are now coming in so uh, when i said that the friendly matches don't count i mean they don't count towards the rating confidence index but every match recorded on the system will have a ratings exchange um salam has a question here harry about the availability or opportunity to play so do we do we see there being an equal opportunity for people to play in or have uh, to play matches and record matches across the country? So I would say, obviously, players that are areas of the country that have a higher density of players and more courts, there is inherently more opportunity to play just by virtue of the fact that there is more competition, more people to, to compete against, more places to play at. Um, however, at this stage, I, I believe, and Kim, correct me if I'm wrong, that all states are at least eligible to be open to squash. Um, and uh, we work very closely with all um, tournament directors and facilities, and we, we do active outreach, and we also um, do respond to, to requests. A lot of people do reach out to us proactively as well. And we have a, a lot of... Um, tools and features through the club locker software to be able to help clubs facilitate leagues, box leagues, ladders, in club tournaments. Um, uh, we've been in heavily encouraging players to um, use their ratings as a metric. So rather than um, simply um, segmenting yourself or, or isolating yourself to players of your specific gender and age, using the, the rating as a metric to find an opponent who might be a couple years older than you of a different sex. Um, there, there are definitely ways to, to uh, find competition right now. And um, ultimately, and, and I, I think one of the, the, the benefits of this, this phantom point system that we are working with is, is it does act as a bit of a safety net where we're not saying players get zero. There's no player in this situation that gets zero points assigned to them. There's just, because the points that are going to be assigned are based on a player's rating and the overall accuracy of a player's rating is largely um, a factor of the number of matches that a player has been, that, that a player has recorded on the system. So by that, I mean a player who has played two matches versus a player who has played a hundred matches. There's uh, less stability in the player that's played fewer matches. And there's just a, a lower degree of confidence in the accuracy of that rating because of the uh, fewer data points that inform that rating. So as players, uh, I mean, uh, obviously Kim, Kim mentioned that we, I think today marks the one year mark uh, as to when, when play was uh, kind of shut down and stopped and halted um, at the squash in the United States and, and globally. But um, 
there has been a, a lot of activity since then. Um, and um, th th those opportunities to compete, to play squash, to put results in the system will just continue to increase between now and um, May 26th when, when this uh, phase two begins and when those points will be assigned. And I would also add that um, th there is a lot of activity, like Harry said. Now, I think Alyssa is saying here that sometimes, perhaps in the school match or in a school situation, that sometimes the matches are not recorded. And in, the, in this case, if you would like them to be recorded, we can we actually actively do that. We just need to reach out to us and we'll talk to your, your coach and work with them to see how we can do it. We really just want to have matches that are recorded on a system that have been overseen by a coach effectively so if you're if you have matches and they're not on the system like let us know and we'll figure out how we can do that for you um and as harry also said that there's plenty of activity there has been plenty of activity and we are currently increasing the number of tournaments that are available on the system so there are some places southern california is one place and actually philadelphia is another that only recently have opened up for competitive play and so you will start to see some more events coming on those areas I, I know in southern california they've got their first tournament coming and we're working actively with the philadelphia coaches now to provide those that opportunity um harry someone wasn't sure what accredited play means. Could you, you kind of said it, but can you kind of elaborate yeah. a little bit more? So again, it's, um, so through club locker, there are leagues, there are box leagues, there are ladders, there are tournaments, there's round robins, there's kind of like uh, for formalized play structures, um, which are organized at either the club level or the district level or the national level in the case of like a, a gold, silver, bronze uh, tournament structure but effectively any match that goes in the system through one of these formal um, avenues is considered to be accredited. Yeah, and, and once again, if, there are, if there's play going on at your club and you want those matches recorded, we can do that. We just need to work with your, with your club pro to do that. And for those who have not had opportunity yet, please continue to look at the, um, the tournament page as we continually adding um, events to the calendar. Let's move on to the, the phantom points um, system. Um, would you like to uh, describe that in a little bit more detail? Yep. So um, again, um, so one of, one of the positives that, that U.S. Squash sees with the phantom points process is that it does act as a safety net. Um, as we all know, there have been um, variable levels of access and openness across the country based on the variable stages of and, and, and positivity rates of COVID in, in states across the country, um, availability of facilities within each individual state, um, individual circumstance of players to, to be able to get on court. Um, and um, as I said a second ago, like in, in this situation, there are no players that will effectively be starting at zero. All players will have a conversion from their rating to their points and then there will be an adjustment to those points based off of their, their RCI, the number of matches that they have been recording um, and, and playing. Um, so with regards to the phantom points specifically, as I said, there is a um, one component is the RCI. The other is how the points are, the top level number of points is determined, which is a calculation that, that uh, translates a player's rating into a specific point value. So in order to find that, um, US Squash, we looked at, at rankings calculations from um, I think early March and before in order to look at the baseline of where point values were across various across each age group and where the, how those points translated into, into player ratings. Um, so I think something that is important to, to mention here is that each, in, each division was looked at in isolation. So why I think that's important is if you're a 4.5 player that's 10 years old, um, on the points table, on the point scale that we, we use and that tournaments have always used or, or our junior points tournaments have always used, um, that 4.5 U11 player may be number one in the country and therefore has a higher point 
value than let's say a U19 player um, who uh, at a 4.5 would probably be closer to 75 or 100 in the country. So um, there is variability in that conversion across the different age groups. Um, and again, it does track the, the effectively where people were, not individually where they were, but where ratings translated into points um, based on our, um, the existing points table that we had been using up until March when we uh, needed to um, suspend competition. And those points tables are expected to be uh, in place when we resume at the end or the beginning of September. Um, and so the points will be assigned. So again, the points are based off of this conversion of rating to points and then adjusted based on participation since October. Um, and those points will be assigned to player profiles to every single player's profile who is listed in the rankings. Um, so that means they're a US squash member, they have a rating, they have a date of birth listed on their profile. Um, they've passed the referee exam specific to their age group. Every single person that meets that criteria will receive points. Um, each player will receive four individual phantom point tournaments um, with the drop-off dates that are listed below. They do, these will not follow the traditional 11 month um, cycle that a standard tournament that players participate in would follow. Um, the, these phantom points are um, intended to be used as a starter for players um, to, to get back into competition, gives them a starting point and it allows them a little bit of time to, to get back on court. Cause again, everyone is in a different circumstance and um, effectively right. not saying that all players need to, you know, jump right back into the national travel, national competition as of Memorial day. Um, so the standard age up policies um, that we have had um, will be applied to these phantom points. So anyone that is aging up during the summer months or in the fall and winter, um, the standard um, age up percentages um, do apply. And as a reminder, I believe it's 45% from U11 to 13, 50% from U13 to U15, 60% from U15 to U17 and 65% from U17 to U19. Um, and another important point about the phantom points is that um, tournaments that are played in, points that are earned from participation take priority over phantom points that are assigned to players' profiles. So as of May 28th, these points will be assigned. So each player will receive four tournaments on their profile. Um, if a player then chooses to play in, a, in, a, in an event that weekend, um, effectively they will have three phantom tournaments and one actual tournament, one tournament that they've participated in. So their exposure count will still be four at that point, but the tournament that they played in is automatically used. And then um, the three remaining phantom uh, tournaments will will still be there as well. Um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else I missed, Kim? Um, could you talk about when families will be able to project what their points yes. might be? Yes, very important piece, <laughs> uh, the actual information. Um, so as of um, on or before April 12th, so the beginning of this play for or prepare for play period, which is a six week kind of um, get ready to start start playing to 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 restart the junior play for points period. Um, US squash will have a, um, a tool like an online tool that users can can or that players can use to, to project their um, their the phantom points that would be assigned and, and what this tool would look like is basically input one is a player's rating input two is their age group and then out comes the um the three different tiers based on um or three potential options of points that would be assigned which would be based on a high medium and low rci um and that would be available at the latest by april 12th when this play for or prepare for play period begins I, I haven't got any other questions on here at the moment. 
they did come in as a slurry last time, so. Yeah, all good. Uh, okay, perfect, let's go to the next slide. So there's a lot of questions about the tournament schedule that will be put in place over the summer, so if you would like to speak to that. Yeah, so um, let's see. So between now and April 12th, we're, we're oh, yeah. kind of where, where we have been, which is just, you know, get on court if you're able, um, uh, encourage your, your local club, your, your, your coaches um, to, to host leagues, box leagues, ladders, host in-house tournaments or tournaments open to a district or, or whatever um, uh, local authorities would allow and just con continue to get ready, enter results in the system to, to maximize your RCI. Um, and as of on April 12th, or before U.S. Squash will have announced um, the full schedule of events for the summertime, um, or I guess between Memorial Day and, and Labor Day, so that that um, play for points period, uh, which is which is phase two of this process. Um, currently, U.S. Squash is is, is actively working with uh, pros and facilities across the country to get a better understanding of of the facilities that are interested in hosting the facilities that are able to host um, and we are we're working with them to to finalize details and and get these events finalized and on the calendar um, these events will be um, some events will be closed to players of a specific region so what that means is let's say um, uh, an event is on the a closed event is on the west coast it's only open to players that are on the west coast uh, someone from from new york would not be able to to participate in that event um, and then there will also be open events so that could be you know on the west coast as well and players from anywhere in the country is eligible to participate in that tournament um, events will be hosted in every single region at each level um, during this play for points period um, so um, there will be opportunity within each region to to play to earn points um, and to um, minimize the travel that is required of, of players um, during this this um, play for points period the qualification into tournaments will still be based off of player rating um, seating at these tournaments will still be based off of rating uh, national rankings will still be based off of player rating. Um, and but but the divisions at these tournaments themselves will be age group based. So similar to what they had been. So U11 through U19 um, in the boys and girls divisions. And um, I guess we are still still working with facilities to, to have an understanding of with new um, protocols that will be put in place in result of the uh, of COVID-19. Um, the size of these events, um, the divisions that are hosted at any single one of these events. So sometimes they may, it's possible that some may need to be split over multiple weekends. Um, um, we would like to be able to host some divisions up to 64 players. Um, um, so there, there's still some detail to, to be hashed out on this, but um, the, the full summer calendar will be available at the latest on April 12th. Uh, with regards to these events during the play for points period. Um, and I guess I did leave out that during this period, uh, results in these tournaments would earn player, players would be earning points by playing in these tournaments. Um, it wouldn't simply just be rating exchange, although there will be a rating exchange with those results. Um, they would be effectively banking those points. They would be applied to player profiles. Um, and again, any tournament that is played in um and where points are earned those would be replacing um any phantom points or one of the phantom point uh tournaments that had been assigned to a player's profile um during this period i think one of the questions that we did get a couple times um leading up to the call was whether or not players would be eligible to play in older age groups um or or more than that and at the moment yes but similar to the way things had been uh, points are specific to a player's age um, or the age group that they participated in. 
the phantom points that will be assigned to players um, on May 28th will be based on the player's age as of that date. Um, so if you're 10 years old, you're getting U11 points. If you're 13 years old, you're getting U15 points. Um, and so if a player does choose to play up during these summer months in an older age group, they would, so let's say we have a U15 player that wants to play in the U17s, the points that would have been assigned to them, the phantom points that would have been assigned to them are U15 points. Um, but they, by participating in the U17 division, they would be earning under 17 points. Um, so wanted to clarify that. And then um, starting on September 8th, the uh, is the expected and anticipated start date for the, just to, to fully go back into a points-based um, ranking system, points-based um, qualification into tournaments, points-based seating. Um, and we are expecting that the national calendar for events after starting on or after September 8th um, would be available in early July. Um, most likely starting with the JCTs and national championships and gold level tournaments uh, with a number of silvers and then and then adding as many as uh, as appropriate thereafter. Is there anything I, I missed there, Kim? Um, it, was, it was pretty good, pretty comprehensive. Um, let me see, there was a question here. I mean, um, there's a question about draw sizes um, because there's a worry and a concern that uh, tournaments will be oversubscribed. So could you speak to that? Uh, yeah, so there are a bunch of different... Um, Levers isn't necessarily the right word, but uh, consideration. So draw size, as I said a second ago, we do want to be able to host up to 64 player draws, but this might uh, require us to be a little bit more creative with how the tournament is actually structured. So we're working through some of these details with tournament directors and, and pros around the country, but um, long story short on that is there are options where maybe uh, one weekend, uh, again, multiple weekends is a, is a possibility. So maybe like this weekend is for the, the U15s through the U19s and, and the second weekend is for the U11s through the U13s um, or some combination thereof or uh, the, the actual draws themselves that are, are played. Um, like a, I believe a 32 player um, turn or 32 player draws across all 10 divisions is about 600 matches over the course of the weekend. So um, there are considerations that need to be made about uh, and, and Kim may be able to touch on this, but like occupancy of the facilities, the, the duration that matches need to be scheduled for. Um, but um, the main piece is we are working with tournament directors in every single region and we have a, a very good understanding of how many players exist or are actively competing and playing and are ranked within each region. And um, there will be opportunity for, for players of, of all levels um, to, to participate in tournaments within their region. That's right. And just to add, like, because of the uh, protocols that we'll have in place, which Harry touched on, the COVID protocols, we believe they'll still be in place during during this time, which means that we would need to have a match played. We would need some time between that finishing and the next one starting. So, you know, whereas we've always had a follow on approach, having that more controlled structure to tournaments will mean that we need a lot more courts to play out the same level or same size of tournaments that we had before. So, for instance, the you know JCT, which was 32, 32 draw, uh, apart from the under 11s, we used to need at least 14 courts over those two and a half days. We would need at least 20 courts now to run that event in a in a safe COVID protocol kind of way. And then when you filter that down to the 16 draws and the 24 draws, we you know where we might have needed 10 courts, we're going to need 15. And so, and so that is why we we were going to have we need to really think very carefully about where these tournaments are and whether they're over two weekends or not and which divisions will have where and then if we then astutely put the um overlay the point system on it then we can have different levels of tournament 
and try to, minim try to minimize the amount of times where there would be a wait list or where there would be uh, a situation where people couldn't find a tournament of the right level. Similar to how we've had the bronze, silver, gold, et cetera, where we have uh, wait lists. Anybody on a wait list should be able to find some appropriate opportunity to increase their, um, to increase their points. So we're going to try to use the same philosophy when we put out these tournaments for the summer. In terms of policies uh, and uh, timelines, Harry, are we changing them or are, are they going to be the same as we always do before? Sorry, say that again? For the policies in terms of timelines and, and in terms of withdrawal penalties, et cetera, how are we going to approach that? Um, still up for consideration working through some of those details, but um, I mean, there, there will be increased flexibility. Um, and especially with regards to a late withdrawal policy, obviously safety is paramount in, in this situation in these times. Um, so so we, we are not um, hoping for situations where, where symptomatic um, participants of a tournament do show up and um, therefore for something like a, a late withdrawal um, penalty, we are, are definitely um, leaning towards the side of leniency and safety. Um, tournament timelines will be will be similar to, to what they were um, with regards to an entry deadline um, and entries closing around one and a half weeks before the start of an event. Um, and with uh, once we get to this um, play for points period um, qualification into tournaments. So in the event that a cut list does need to be made, obviously uh, making all efforts to avoid those situations. Um, um, the qualification will be based off of player rating. Um, once we get back into um, events after September 8th, it would uh, qualification would be based off of cutlass points as they had been in the past. Seating would be based off of cutlass points. Um, but yeah. All right, let's um, let's move on. And we've I'm conscious of time here. So what I wanted to do is to go through some player scenarios because everyone's in a slightly different situation. And this is also on the website and on the communication we sent out on Friday. So, you, and I can also send it with a follow-up email tomorrow morning. But what we've tried to do is, is go through, like you're this type of player, you've had this, this um, opportunity to play, what should you do now? So if you just bear with me while I get that information up here. Um, Harry, could you monitor the questions, please? As yep. I go through this, <laughs> thank you. So. This first situation, this is our ideal situa situation that we would love We would love for everybody to be in this situation. Obviously, we know you're not, but if you have had the opportunity to play and record matches and you have done that since October 2020, this means that your rating is stable, it's reliable, it's, it's an indicator of your current level of play. So you'll be awarded your 100% of your phantom points. Um, your RCI score will be high. And recommended action for you is to just continue, um, continue to play, continue to train, and you're, you're putting yourself in a good place to start on uh, those stage two tournaments. So that's the ideal scenario, but that's, uh, that's not the case everywhere. So then there's this scenario that some of you have uh, spoken about in the chat tonight. So you, you really want to play the matches and you want to record the matches. Um, and the guidelines allow that in your state. And unfortunately, you can't find events or there are no other players with whom you can compete. So those people who, who like um, Salam in, in Michigan, for instance, you can't find any events or any people to play. So what about them? So your rate, the rating will still be high for those players. So that means that it will still reflect the, what their ability was when we stopped. So this time last year, those players will still be rated rel relative to where they were and relative to where the players were. So if their opponents have had the opportunity to play um, the, these other one, these players here in this situation, their rating will still be high and it will drift with them. Um, so they will still start with a high seeding when we start stage two. And they will also then be awarded phantom points. Unfortunately, they won't have a, they probably won't have a high um, RCI because they haven't been able to play, but it's it's a safety net. It's like, it's not, we're not designing this to, to penalize you to say, oh, well, you can't play. So, uh, so you can start really, really low and you're never gonna be able to find your, your way back again. That isn't the purpose of the phantom points. This is just to say, look, we're not quite sure what your playing level is now. You haven't played for a year. We do know you're a good player. 
Um, but we just need you to just like to, to prove it again for us. And so we just want to put you a little bit lower because we just don't know. Uh, but not so low that you can't jump back into where your level is. If, if you truly are the same level or even better, it will take you maybe one tournament or you know, probably one tournament just to get your rating back on in, back to where it should be. And so, you're, so you'll be able to jump into the, the right place, an appropriate place for you. So it, is, it does seem concerning right now if you're not able to play, but you should soon be able to, um, once you can start an event, you would soon find your place. Um, again, if you can find people to play, then please do so. But we do understand that that's not always possible in depends on the situation you're in. But again, if you have a teaching pro or cl your club pro and you're struggling to find matches and you really want to, then like contact us and we will help if we can. Um, some people are in a situation where their facility is still closed or they're not allowed to play. I think that's, that is now lifting from what I can see. But again, your rating is still high. Your seeding will, initial seeding will be high. Um, and again, if you, can, if you can find players when it opens, then that's great. But again, don't, don't worry. You're still going to have a platform from which you can jump to find your appropriate level. Sorry, we're going to have my cat. I'm being cat. Yeah, sorry. So again, don't, don't worry about it. You'll still be in a good position to find your place when you can start playing in the summer tournaments. Some people are in a situation where they can't play, excuse me, sorry. Uh, they could play, but they're a little concerned. Just, you know, they may, um, they may, be concerned because of the COVID, they may not want to play, which is, you know, I respect that. Uh, it's still a pandemic. We're not out of it yet. Um, or there are people out there who are a little concerned about their rating adjusting. And they don't want that to happen just yet for, for qualification reasons to other events, um, maybe. So again, your, your rating still reflects your uh, relative ability as of this time last year. So again, your rating will still be there. It will still be high. Um, the issue with not playing, if, if you can play and you're choosing not to, the issue, um, it can be that the next time you play, that match can take on a lot of significance in that um, the, the longer you go without playing, the more unstable your rating is. And so the next time you play, it's going, it could change more. So if you can, if you could record matches, you probably should. Um, but again, understanding that there are personal reasons for not wanting to it's a pandemic and so again don't don't stress too much because you'll still have a platform to jump into your appropriate place and i think there are some people out there who don't really see themselves playing until september which again is, is totally fine if you have a vulnerable individual at, at home and you really you know you really don't want to risk them getting um covid until you're vaccinated say so maybe that's going to take all summer until some of the juniors are vaccinated then again we completely respect that uh, everyone's in a different situation, but know that like, no one is going to be left behind. There will be a safety net. You will be able to jump into the system when you are ready uh, with points that will allow you to get into the, uh, the right level of tournament and then to allow you again to play into the position that you should, you should be in. So again, it, it may seem severe when we're saying we, we throw these percentages around, but we're just trying to where people have got a rating that is accurate, we're, we're trying to give them a, the right kind of number of points based on their rating. And where people are not able to play and we're not sure about their rating, then we just want to give them a platform that they can get back into, uh, into where they should be. So again, this table, uh, there is a table that's on the website and I would urge you to go to read it and it explains all of this a lot more eloquently than I think I just did. So. Um, but I think, I think everyone's in one of these situations. And so I think you can find it helpful to see what your recommended course of action is. Are there any questions, Harry? So there were a couple on just, again, clarifications as to which matches are actually counting. Um, and then um, kind of secondary to that or along the, that's those same lines was um, like, like how will U.S. squash now? What what filter? The question was what filters to U.S. to use on U.S. squash between now and, and September eighth to find the accredited tournament ladder boxes, et cetera. So I think 
a which matches count again if you just restate those and then um basically how how we're going to identify those uh, is my interpretation I just can't. so i think everybody um if you go to your matches profile on, on club locker then you can see each match that's given a type so we have access to that type we can see what types of matches are being recorded and so if it's a tournament or if it's a ladder or a league uh, or box league then we know that that play is accredited we know it's overseen and supervised by a, a club pro where the type says club match then we're not sure whether that's been overseen or not. And while it does change uh, the rating, we because it's not an overseen match, not a, a supervised match, we don't feel that we should we should use that um, as confidence in a, the result. So anything that is accredited, anything that's overseen by the pro, and we do constantly check. You know, somebody, I think, I saw a question from someone saying. Uh, well, you know, this, this girl plays this adult and they just put the result in and they're um, affecting their, their rating and it's unfair. And I can say that you know, Harry and I do look through every single match that's been recorded on the system and take a look at situations where there's a big ratings differential or where there is an adult playing a child to see whether we, we think that there is something that's not quite right about that. Um, and I don't think I've seen any matches that, that cause me concern. But we do look and we do check. Did that, did that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. And then there was a, another a good question with regards to RCI um, and whether or not matches played during the summer would um, adjust the player's RCI. Uh, no, the answer to that is no. We are going to assign the we're going to assign the RCI and the points at the beginning of stage two, and they will be on your profile, and that will not be they will not be adjusted. So as you play during the summer, your play, your seeding may change because of your rating, and that may give you a better chance to earn more points. But we're not going to change the RCI at that point. Gotcha. And um, this this may be on a, a future slide, but um, I just wanted to. Uh, the question was asked if there like uh, processes and, and and protocols with regards to vaccination. You okay. touch on that spe yeah. specifically with regards to uh, sixteen plus players. But yeah, that is, I mean, that is a good question. And we're still working through the um, consequences of the vaccination and what that will mean in terms of uh, protocols in, that we have in place at events. So everybody should assume for now, at least, that um, players will need to wear face masks on court. That may change. Uh, even today, I think um, the president said that everyone should have access to a vaccination by May the 1st. So things are changing very quickly. And we are constantly monitoring that and talking to our medical professionals to get advice on how that should have, how that could affect our protocols. So as soon as we have any change to those protocols, we will let you know. Uh, and um, yeah, so continually changing every day, something's different. I, I mean, I hope that by the end of May that we have something to tell you, but we, we will let you know. We're also looking at the role of testing. Um, some, someone's offered their help in uh, giving us some access to tests and then again what does that mean for an event so we are constantly looking at that to try to alleviate some of these protocols that are currently in place thank you and then just uh, in, in terms of being conscious of time um yes. maybe we move on to, to david <laughs> yeah sorry david has been very very patient but i know the college recruitment and the status of college crush is a big concern for some players who are in their sophomore junior years or in high school so i'm um, and invited David to the call to answer some of those questions. So, uh, David, do you want to tell us where we are with College Crush? Yes, I would be glad to. Uh, thanks, Kim and Harry, for inviting me along. It's great to be with you all. Um, uh, just a quick overview. I know we're a bit short on time. <clears throat> um, uh, Unfortunately, we're still in a, um, an area of uncertainty at the college level. And I, I would just take a moment to kind of uh, zoom out a little bit and understand that or recognize that um, the colleges and universities right now are, are in an uncertain place themselves across the board. Uh, athletic departments as well are also uncertain. Um, you know, thinking about the anniversary of, of this all transpiring um, so much has changed over the last 12 months as far as the college athletics landscape is concerned and uh, around all sorts of areas, budgeting, recruiting, um, personnel, 
alignment, some some places closing, some programs being cut, some others being added. So uh, we're still working our way through all of those uh, items. And um, so there is, unfortunately, there's, there's not a, um, a ton of clarity right now on how um, recruiting for those who would be applying in the in the fall, uh, how that's all going to be working out. Um, that's in terms of uh, recruitable spots. That's in terms of who coaches are going to be looking for, when they're going to be making offers. All of these questions are still to be worked out, even to the point where right now, because we're still um, the uh, coronavirus is still very much with us. Um, there are there are some restrictions on recruiting as well that are still in place that are affecting um, affecting coaches and, and trying to they're still working their way through what their possibilities are. So the overarching message from College Squash and our coaches, uh, um, Kim has joined our, our calls that we have on a regular basis, uh, is to be patient. Um, our coaches are having to be patient. They're having to um, understand the landscape better, understand what their capabilities are. Um, in a constantly changing environment, especially as things appear to be getting slightly better, hopefully. And um, so um, the, really the message is, is bear with us and, um, but be able to communicate your story uh, in a way that uh, clearly conveys who you are, what your aspirations are, and, um, and in a way that differentiates yourself and makes you um, stand out from the crowd. Um, Kim, if you want to go to the next uh, next point, um, so kind of a general question now, talking about college squash recruiting in particular. What can you do now to uh, increase your chances of being recruited? The the first and foremost thing um, from a squash specific perspective is to make sure that all of your information on your club locker profile is up to date, um, and in particular your email address and your high school graduation year. Um, those are two critical pieces of information that college coaches look at to ensure that they're able to reach out to you, um, both from a rules compliance perspective and from the practical matter of sending you an email and knowing that it's going to get to the right place and the right person. So um, also under, you know, filling out as much information as you can share if you're interested in being, um, uh, being contacted by college coaches. So whether that's your, your personal coach, your high school coach, um, your school and, and your, um, and also, uh, you know, to echo what, what Kim and Harry have been saying, playing those matches and recording those results, whether they're formal or informal, uh, really helps give, uh, give the coaches a good perspective on, on you as a player. Um, the other thing I've said, um, I will say, and, and it's important across the board is um, your academic results, you know, everyone who is in school, um, making sure that you're achieving the best results possible in the classroom, you're taking the most rigorous classes that you can take, um, and, um, and also being a good citizen, uh, being a good person, both in, in, in public and in private, so that um, you, can, you can make sure you're putting your best foot forward and the coaches are seeing that. Um, so those are the really the overarching things that you can do um, on a on a on a squash playing perspective. Uh, we highly recommend that you play those matches and you record those results. Um, you uh, everyone you know so I shouldn't say everyone, but so many people have the ability to film their own matches right now, uh, whether it's through a smartphone or um, a, a personal camera. Um, we encourage you to take video of your matches, even if it's not in a sanctioned event, even if it's not in a, uh, a showcase or, or a, a college experience of some sort, take video of your matches and share those with coaches if you're interested in, in, uh, in communicating with them or you're already having conversations with some of the coaches for the, for the older age group. Um, they wanna be able to see you play. The more meaningful the matches, the better, obviously. Um, so they get a good sense of how you're playing. But um, we, if you can send a, if you can send a Snapchat or you can send a TikTok or you can send a video on on Instagram, you can take a video of you playing a squash match and share it with uh, with coaches that you're interested in. I'm gonna go to that question because yeah, so <laughs> yeah, so I kind of I kind of jumped ahead, but that's that's kind of the answer to the next question. Um, that's the biggest, and and Kim, you can put the next one on too. I think. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so these two kind of go together. You know, we worked hand in hand with US Squash to create some of these uh, college recruiting showcases and, and some of the other events that were live streamed and that coaches were able to view from afar because they didn't have the uh, opportunity to view um, tournament play, for example. Um, it is not required for anyone to go to any of these events. They, they certainly help, they provide great access um, the videos, you know, the matches being recorded certainly help coaches who are not able to travel to, to matches in person. So they are certainly helpful, but it's not in no way a requirement and it's no way an indictment if you're not able to attend those matches. As I said, as I just got finished saying, um, taking video of personal video of your matches and, and sharing those with the coaches that you're interested in talking to, um, is a great way to communicate how you're playing, who you're playing with, telling your story in a way that that stands out and be creative too. I mean, again, you, you have, um, you have the possibility in this uncertain, um, time frame and uncertain landscape to, to really stand out in the way that you're communicating, the way that you're telling your story effectively to these coaches. And, uh, I think, um, if, if you do it in a creative and succinct and, and clear way, they'll greatly appreciate that. Next question. Yeah, so then, so the question becomes then, well, what about my player rating? Um, how are they assessing that? The, the coaches, uh, I'm speaking on their behalf now, but this is coming from them. They are, uh, they're savvy to, you know, they use this, use these ratings all the time to assess players and they understand the impact. I mean, just as well as you all on this call, not having a full college squash season this year has been, has had a really major impact on the way that they, they run operations, the way that they're interacting with their teams. So it's, it's affecting them as well. And, and they're, they understand that the player ratings are, are affected by that. The fact that play has been frozen for, for a year now um, is, is going to affect that. And so uh, Kim and Harry and I are in communication with the coaches about, um, about the, the phases of play coming back into play. And, uh, and they understand that the ratings are going to be a work in progress for a while. So uh, that, that just highlights even more why it's important to be able to communicate your, your playing resume, communicate your skills, uh, your plans for the future, your story, and share those, uh, the videos that you have access to and the results that you have access to. So you can, you can paint a full picture for them. Um, and it's not just doesn't just boil down to one number that that you're concerned maybe doesn't describe you as as clearly as it as it should or could. And kind of kind of related, there is a lot of concern about about ratings changing adversely. So, yeah, I, again, I would I would um, one I think w one coach put it to me that that uh, not to panic. There's no. Um, there, there's a lot of understanding on the college coaching side that these these ratings are are not what they what they were before, um, and that the pandemic has has impacted the way that they are calculated and that uh, they're looked at from both the junior community and the and the college community. And so, the really the key moment, and I've said this now a couple times, but I'll, I'll repeat it because it's so important: play the matches, put the results in Club Locker, so that you have a you have a clear story to tell. Um, and as you play more and you get back up to the skill rating that, you know, you can be, um, there will be more confidence. The more time goes by, there will be more confidence in, in those ratings. But right now, everyone uh, on the college side, at least understands that the ratings are not a, a real accurate reflection of, of where things stand as far as your play is concerned. Um, human timelines, have they changed the all due to the pandemic? Um, so uh, currently the timelines have not changed. So uh, remember all of the timelines around recruiting are, are dictated by the offices of admission on college campuses. They're not dictated by the coaches. And so um, those, those timelines are going to, are not going to change. And I think the other, re the other reason we say be patient and, and don't panic is because there are, um, there are spots to fill on college teams. Uh, you know, we have between men's and women's, we have 65 varsity teams. And they're all, every one of those teams is going to look to uh, bring in a new class of players um, in, in the fall and accept applications. And they're going to be pushing to, to bring in their students. And so um, uh, that doesn't, to get more specific about the question on the screen about formal offers, um, 
I will say that it's, uh, I, I can't answer that with one. There's no one size fits all answer to that question. Um, some coaches are going to be uh, more upfront about it. Others are going to be holding off maybe to see some more results and giving you, giving you all an opportunity, even from places where uh, there's not, uh, not as much as open right now. Um, so they, and, and most of the time, um, and just as a reminder for the timeline, uh, most formal offers in general can't be, can't really be made until around July of uh, between your junior and senior year. I know there are some um, maybe uh, high achieving individuals that, um, that some coaches identify as someone that they want on the team a little earlier than that. Um, but for the most part, between the, the demands of the admissions offices, the financial aid offices, and uh, the confidence in, in coaches and that what they're able to offer, uh, there's still a lot of time. We're, we're only in March. Um, and if you look towards June or July as a, as a chance for um, when, when more concrete offers come out or when, when they'll ask for more information um, for academic pre-reads, for example, where they're looking at uh, maybe test scores or your or your GPA and, and your your resume. Um, those are gonna, those are going to be coming later from a lot of coaches. And so, I, again, I would be patient and, and don't get discouraged if if you don't feel like those are coming because they will um, inevitably they will because that the application deadlines in the fall are still going to be there and they're going to want to fill their classes. I'm just conscious of time, everyone. I know it's nine o'clock, so we're an hour in. We've probably got another maybe 10 minutes to go. So I hope that you can stay on the call. Um, but if not, of course, you, you can always email us and, or contact us directly and we can answer any uh, concerns that you may have separately. But we'll probably go on for, say, for another about 10 minutes. Um, David, I think there's another one more question here about coaching. Oh, yeah. So this is um, a question that we get about um, every once in a while from, from recruits sort of looking across, across the field, there is a, um, there is a way that college coaches do have the ability to, to coach high school recruits, but it's, it's based on a, a, a piece of a piece of legislation, a rule around what's called local sports clubs. So if, um, if a college coach is, is running uh, their own operation, uh, which they have, um, and they're, they're renting out the courts of their, their, their home facility, which they have the, the possibility to do, uh, they could theoretically be uh, be a coach of someone in their local area. They have to be within, generally speaking, they have to be within a 50 mile radius of that of that club or that that program. And um, and in some cases, college coaches do uh, do act as the coach for um, for a high school player or a junior player that's that's of recruitable age, a ninth grader or above, uh, and that that is permissible. And um, when it happens, the the um, the coaches are upfront with that, uh, with their compliance offices and their athletic departments about about that relationship. And so, it's um, it's it's generally all ab above board, and it's it is approved and permissible. Um, it doesn't happen often uh, because there is there is kind of uh, a, a, a discomfort about it sometimes. But there are cases where college coaches can coach high school players, especially if the, especially if there's an established relationship from when the player was much younger. Uh, David, we have a, an interesting question here from, from someone, uh, from Mike. He's asking, are we seeing fewer players um, from abroad, international players being recruited or showing any interest in US colleges because of the pandemic? I don't know whether you have any insight to that. Um, I can't, uh, I, I would only be speculating if I provided an answer. Um, it feels like this has been dragging on for a long time, but in reality, um, it's, it's really one year and one recruiting cycle. And I, I don't even have uh, full information uh, about the incoming uh, incoming classes. Um, in fact, the regular decision, I you know, re regular decision applications are being decided on sort of as we speak, and and some players will will be sorting out their college choices over the next few months. And so, um, that's still to be determined. I don't have a clear answer on that, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions for David? If you could put them in the chat, that would be great. Um, meanwhile, let's just address a couple of other questions and we'll come back to any, any other uh, questions that are in the chat. So a couple of other slightly, un slightly unrelated um, topics that came up from the submissions uh, was about, particularly about the Scholar Athlete Award, there was some concern about Scholar Athlete. Uh, Harry 
would you like to answer this question? Yeah, we definitely. Um, and so what I would say is um, a U.S. squash, we, we adjusted the, the policy, the criteria, the participation criteria for this past year to account for, for COVID. And we did it again this year. Just So previously, you needed to have played in a specific grouping of matches through tournaments or, um, or through your high school leagues. And we have opened that up to include any, um, I guess, accredited play. So similar to, to that RCI uh, requirement, it's, it's any accredited match. Um, so it could be any in-club play. It could be challenge ladder amongst a high school team or a middle school team. It could be a box league amongst, amongst a club. It could be, again, just any accredited play counts. So um, that has, in theory, increased access to, to that participation uh, criteria for the award. Um, there's obviously a lot of concern about being able to hit that 12 match uh, threshold. Um, again, given the, the variable um, uh, statuses of access to, to different um, uh, competitions ar around, the, around the country based on your clubs, based on your personal situation. Um, it's something that we would consider and, and like uh, making adjustments to the, to the criteria. Um, we just aren't there today. We're about 150 days, 150 days from the, the deadline to complete these 12 matches. Um, fingers crossed, we're hopeful that the situation is improving around the country, that uh, accredited play opportunities will be increasing. Um, and one of the, the best things about the Scholar Athlete Award it, is that it, it's um, in recognition of, of players, the student athlete achievement. So um, we, we can provide flexibility from, from this standpoint. It's not similar to qualifying into a tournament where if you wave someone in, you bump someone out. Um, for this, we, we want to um, acknowledge and celebrate all players that um, are, are actively competing in squash and are able to maintain high academic standards outside of squash. Um, so um, we are um, keeping our, our eyes peeled and, and, and uh, keeping appraised of the situation and adjustments will be made if, if warranted. Um, but again, at the moment today, um, the, the expectation, the participation criteria of 12 accredited matches um, is, is the policy. Thank you. I mean, I know a lot of people are concerned about that. Um, somebody also asked a question about uh, 2021 nationals and the US Junior Open. And I can say that we are actively looking at or exploring the possibility of running a 2021 Junior Nationals. We have not um, pinned down any dates yet or the exact format, but we are looking to see what it is that we could provide this year. And I guess we're kind of monitoring the situation with respect to vaccines, with respect to travel. So um, we'll let you know as soon as we've made some decisions regarding the 2021 Nationals. And we certainly hope that we can run the 2021 US Junior Open in December. So we are, we, are, we are planning to do that. We haven't pinned that, we haven't actually put it on the calendar yet. We're still working through some of the some um, issues, but that is what we hope that we can do this year for those two particular events. And then um, we also would hope that by 2022 that we can continue with our um, high school nationals, middle school nationals, etc. So we are looking at the national calendar for next season and we hope that we can provide you with the opportunities that unfortunately people has missed this, this year. A couple of you asked about the British Junior Open and uh, I wanted to recognize that uh, and they just had been asked this question. Obviously we don't really know the answer to this question right now because we don't know what the criteria for the British Junior Open will be in 2022. We assume there will be one in 2022. So what we all do is we'll monitor for information from England Squash and once we have that information, then we'll work out how we want to respond to that this year and how we will, um, if, if and when we'll send a team or how that will look and what the squad will look like. But uh, we, again, we'll wait for England Squash to give us uh, some guidance on when this will happen uh, and the size of it. And then we, will, then we will get back to you with how we will approach it this year. Uh, I think that's the, the end of the, oh no. Sorry, one more question. We kind of addressed this question about masks and testing. Um, again, 
you know, there are some uh, questions in the chat too. We will be requiring face masks for the moment until we until some change or some guidance has changed. So we're looking at that from the authorities now, and that will inform us as to when uh, we can adjust our protocols. Clearly, like vaccinations and testing, there has to be an opportunity to adjust the protocols. But again, we're looking to the authorities for some help with that and to our medical um, people too. So more news on that as more information becomes available. So are there any questions people have? So in terms of the center, the National Center, somebody asked about here, the National Center is almost complete. Uh, we're hoping to, to start to office out of there in the next month, I think, uh, which is very exciting for us to actually see each other in person after a year will be uh, very welcome. Um, looking forward to that. So we're hoping that that will happen, I think, uh, April, and then we're looking to run events out of the center um, over the summer. So again, more news on that as the centre becomes open and the, the country itself becomes open. But that's quite exciting. It's, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen any of the pictures on the, on the website, but it's, it's quite spectacular. So we're really looking forward to having that as our base. Um, so I, I think that's probably the end of the, the questions on here. But uh, as I said, please make, oh no, maybe two came in. Uh, thank, but thank everyone for coming on the call and for spending that extra 10 minutes with us. I hope we answered some of your questions uh, that you had. But again, you know where we are, you, you have our emails. Um, so please feel free to contact us directly, um, either of us, any of the three of us. We're happy to help answer your questions. It is, uh, I guess, quite complicated. It could be quite complicated. So happy to try to address any of your concerns. And again, if you, if you want more play, you want more accredited play, please reach out to your Club Pro and we will work with them to try to, 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 to do what we can. So really looking forward to seeing everyone, um, hopefully over the summer and certainly towards September, but uh, thank you all for being on the call.